Amen. Okay, thanks to be here again. Thank you, Stan, for inviting us. I, am, uh, I, I have looked forward to this time, and I want to give thanks for every opportunity I can get to share the gospel wherever it means that God has placed me to do so, and I'm grateful that I am here today. So can I start by praying, because I know I need the help as much as we all need the help to understand God's word. Father, we do not take, and I certainly do not take for granted, Lord, the fact that your word is obvious. Lord, we know that what is written can be heard, but Lord God, we realize that Jesus says we need to hear, and we need to listen so that we actually can hear the gospel, hear the truth, and respond to it, and be obedient, Lord. And I pray, Father, for today, Lord, for us all, that we might hear what you would speak into our lives. We thank you for the promise of your spirit, Lord, that we have not given our own human reason alone to to take this in. But, Lord, you have given us your help. Lord, should we obey it? Should we humble ourselves? So I pray, Father, for us all, that you will speak in your voice into our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here we are, a rock and a hard place. Can I start by just kind of a general illustration? Um, How good are you at remembering people who have helped you along your way in those important parts of life? You know, think of your wedding speeches, lifetime achievement awards. Sometimes it can be very difficult to remember all those people that ought to be remembered. We're going to look at today, Jonathan. And I want to be thankful today that history has not forgotten someone like Jonathan. Even though he may not be preached from our pulpits today, the writer of history has made sure David, Saul, and Jonathan are remembered in this book. Even though there will only be one chapter given to him where he is, as it were, the centerpiece. He is sandwiched between two other chapters, both chapters 13 and 15, where Saul is now failing. As God's chosen leader. In chapter 13 he has been told. By Samuel that his kingdom will be taken away from him. In chapter 15 again. Through Saul's own disobedience he will be told again. God will definitely take your kingdom away from you. And here we have in the middle in chapter 14. The crown prince Jonathan who would be king who you actually look at and say, wow, chapter 14 paints a different light. It's not because of Jonathan's failings that Saul's house will not continue, but because of Saul's own unfaithfulness. So here we have an unsung hero, but not unsung by David himself. If we look to the beginning of 2 Samuel, we see the Song of the Bow, a whole song given to both Saul and to Jonathan. How the mighty have fallen. How often we actually hear that and think of it in our own war heroes. But really it was actually written from the ancient history of Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Both Jonathan and Saul are remembered as such. In many ways he's very similar to like John the Baptist. John the Baptist might easily again be have, had been forgotten in the histories of the Gospels simply because of how big Jesus is. How big a figure. But like David, Jesus points to John the Baptist and tells him and tells the people who he is. And in Matthew 11.11 11, he says this, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The bigger figures of history have to tell us the other people that ought not to be forgotten. 
the ones that we sometimes forget in our own speeches and our own times of giving thanks. I want to make some observations before we get to a, an application of how can we look at this text and apply it to our lives today. And I need to make four sections of observations. And the first one comes from verse 1. And I see the theme of verse 1 as Jonathan's decisiveness. Jonathan's decisiveness. So what's happening here? The fuller picture is obviously actually in chapter 14. We see the Philistines are raiding Israel's outer skirts. Bands of raiders are going out. Saul gathers an army, as he's supposed to as the king, to fight off these people. But we find he is sitting in a cave with 600 men. If you're familiar with 1 Samuel, we know that previously Saul was able to, to be able to command a lot larger army than this. But at this present moment in time, only 600 men are present with him. So Philistines are raiding Israel's villages and Saul is sitting down, hiding in a cave. It would appear that from this situation as we come into chapter 14 has not changed at all. So this section brings, opens us up to speculation. I mean, you know, there's no, we've not given any motivation as to why uh, Jonathan decides. But it just says, one day, what can I speculate from that? That numerous days had passed. And at one particular point, Jonathan had now decided enough's enough. I'm going to move. I'm going to do something. We only know what he's going to do when it comes to verse 6, which is to attack a Philistine garrison. But all we see is the movement of Jonathan towards his enemy. So here we are, Jonathan... Again, as I speculate, is fed up and wants to move. And his armour bearer is with him. The next section with some observations I would like to make is from verses 2 and 3. And this section I call the rejected establishment. The rejected establishment. Why do I say that? As these raiding parties are moving throughout Israel, we also see the narrator of this historical document make a comment on who is actually present with Jonathan, with, with Saul and Jonathan. And it mentions Ahijah's family tree. So if it just said Ahijah, you might just say, oh, okay, he's the priest. But again, if you're aware of what's happening in 1 Samuel and look back to chapter 2, you'll find that Ahijah is a great-grandson of of Eli. Eli, who in chapter 2 was, though a good man, was not good when it came to disciplining his sons, who were rebellious priests. In actual fact, the, the word calls them worthless men. They were priests of God, but acted literally like devils. If Eli was to be faithful in his service, he would have had to have removed them. But he didn't. And as such, God had rejected him and his priesthood and said his family will no longer have a man in the priesthood in the years to come, in the generations to come. What does this mean? Here we have the rejected priesthood sitting right alongside the rejected monarchy. And I think this is what the narrator is trying to make out to us. This is where the establishment has actually failed. And they failed because they're sitting down, doing nothing. 
It also mentions that a hydra is wearing the ephod. I think this again is a hint that Saul either doesn't want to seek the word of God because the ephod was used to consult God and to give direction as to what to do. What to do. So it mentions that a hydra is wearing the ephod, but it seems that either God is not answering them or they are not asking God what to do. Do you know churches today where people have the Bible present but not really consult it? Kind of reminds me of that situation. We sit, want in direction, but ask anything other than, God, what does your word say? Where is your past faithfulness that I might be encouraged and actually be inspired? What does this mean, Jonathan moving away? Does that mean that we should now reject any kind of leadership we don't think is godly anymore? Is this an advocation of rebellion? I don't think it is. The word clearly tells us that we are to respect leaders, even if they don't follow the word of God. But what we see here is that Jonathan is moving out by himself to place himself in a position where God can use him if he, Saul is not going to put himself in a position where God can use him. This is not a coup d'etat like Absalom does in Second Samuel against his own father, David. Very different actions. Absalom is an unfaithful son, whereas Jonathan is a faithful one. There, I think, is a great model of what it means to be disciplined, to respect your, your, your parents, but at the same time, to be able to move faithfully in what God is telling you to do. The next section, 4 and 5, in verses 4 and 5, I've actually said this is, between, this is called Between a Rock and a Hard Place, the title that we have today for our, our teaching. Now we see the writer giving a description of the geography that lies between the Philistine army and the Israelite army. And I can picture it as a, as a, as a kind of a rocky valley. A rocky valley. One of them, if you translate the names of these Hebrew rocks, is called slippery, or as one commentator puts, called gleaming. Maybe that the, the rock surface is facing the sun, and therefore is shiny, it's very hard to see. And the other one is called fawny. It seems that both these, this rocky valley that lies between the camp of the Israelites and the camp of the Philistines is a very dangerous terrain. A rocky terrain that we might traverse at our peril. Hence the names. It's interesting that the prisons that we have in our own lives can be very much like these rock and a hard place. I would go and do what I need to do, but it's so difficult to do that. And here I give a bit of hint of my own application. Lord, for me to be obedient, it's going to take me to move from this position of comfort through a position of discomfort, then only to face an even bigger enemy, an enemy that will hit back. But yet moving in faith requires us to navigate these rocks and hard places in our own lives. My last set of observations comes from 6 and 7. And I've called it faith breeds faith. In other words, like doubt breeds doubt, so faith breeds faith. And not just talking about speaking faith, but being around faithful people. I like the response of, of Jonathan's armour bearer. My heart and my soul is with you. Jonathan's faith is infectious. His vision of God is infectious. He's, the the, the, the armour bearer doesn't feel like he's going to his death. He feels like he's going on an adventure. 
and his heart is with him. Not his body, his heart. I, I actually want to be with that. I like that. An infectious faith. It might also be that the words that Jonathan says here, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving for by, by many or by few, might highlight the disagreement that Saul and Jonathan might actually have had. As I said, this opens us up to speculate. It may be that Jonathan is a better student of history than his father is. His father has 600 men. Jonathan's probably thinking, well, that's actually twice as many as Gideon had to fight an innumerable army of Midianites. You have twice as much. You're not actually in a, in a, in a disadvantage when you've got God on your side. And I believe this is what leads him to actually say, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. A hint of an argument. Well, you sit there with 600 men. Dad, I'm going. My first application is trying to look at the whole idea of what it means to understand the doctrine of God. And why it's helping Jonathan in this particular situation. The fundamental problem that we have, I believe, is that... is one that has actually been with us right from the very beginning, when we look at the garden and Adam and Eve. The desire to be God. The doubting of God's goodness. The doubting of his ability to actually have told Adam and Eve the truth about the tree. That allowed the devil to say, yea, did God actually say? The believing of the serpent has led to make man the centre of his own life. It means that God is no longer something that we find outside of ourselves, but God is actually found within ourselves. I am God. I am the centre of the universe. I will make my own decisions. I will determine my own fate. I, I, I. That's the gist of what we have lost when we don't actually have a good God doctrine. He doesn't make this decision, Jonathan doesn't make this decision based on his finite human nature. He makes this decision based on the infinite God who also he, he, he's not making the mistakes of the pagan religions of those times. He's not assuming, one, that God's actions are bound to his sacrifice, i.e., I can manipulate God by putting myself in danger, and therefore, you know, as it was customary to, to kind of cut yourself to try and show your sincerity. He is not trying to bribe God. He understands that God is free. To do as he pleases. As the Hebrew boys say to Nebuchadnezzar, isn't it? When, he go, when they go into the fire. God could save us. But if he doesn't, we still won't bow the knee. I'm going over. God could help us. God could win, win us a victory. But he is doing what he has to faithfully do. Jonathan just puts himself at God's disposal. So by faith, he moves out of hiding with his father, to a place where he has contact with the enemy. Therefore, giving God an opportunity to work through him. I don't think we understand this dynamic of faith in our modern setting. Why do I say that? Because faith tends to be a feeling, and then faithfulness tends to be the action. But within the Hebrew language, they're both one and the same. If I have faith, I am faithful. I can't separate them. Faith is an action and not just something I feel or believe.
It's also important to realise that two things about faith. A lot more could be said, but two things I want to note tonight. It is not irresponsible and it is not irrational. Today, faith seems to me this leap of faith where we just seem to just think of the best thing that comes to our mind and we just go for it and wish the best. A kind of hapless optimism. That's not faith. What do I mean by this? Jonathan is not putting himself in unnecessary danger in the hope that God will bail him out. And like I said, he's not a pagan in that sense. As the prince of Israel, like the judges before him, it was his and his father's duty to defend Israel. To go out and defeat the enemies of God. And so therefore, he knows he needs to do this task. He's only asking that God helps him to actually do it. In that sense, it's not irresponsible for him to put himself in harm's way when it is actually his duty to do so. You might say very much like David, a young shepherd boy, in a few chapters after this, goes against a huge giant called Goliath. You might say that kind of a matchup is irrational, irresponsible. Who would let somebody go and do that? Would you let your teenager go out and fight the Klitschko brothers? Or Anthony Joshua? No. (laughs) We would consider that to be irresponsible. Such as the PC age that we have. Secondly, Jonathan's faith is not irrational to the extent that he is taking a blind step of faith by assuming that God may be able to help him. What we actually see is Jonathan has a firm grasp of who God is. A firm grasp of what God can do. Like I said, he might even have been using Gideon as a reference point at this particular junction of his life. But I want to illustrate this for you. And it's good to illustrate because, again, this is something that I think we need to understand. We need to visualise God's word. And I, I kind of thought, imagine I'm a, again, I'm a, I'm a Londoner a few hundred years ago. And let's just say St. Paul's has just re- recently been erected. You know, obviously after the Great Fire of London great building work happened across London. And imagine I'm walking into St. Paul's Cathedral for the first time. And as I look around, I'm marvelling at this wonderful building. Then I get a thought to myself. I said, I I, I would love to buy, I, I would love to build a house. I wonder if the person, the architect, is actually able to create a house for me. Now I know you're going to say to me, Sir Christopher Wren could definitely do that. He could build me a house. The problem is, is that Christopher Wren might build me a very, very grand house, more than I could probably afford. But that's a minor problem. He definitely can build you a house. And that's my point. As Jonathan knows who God is, sees the creation, sees everything that he has done, knows the history of Israel coming out of Egypt. Here I am, the great deliverer of the Israelites from the mighty power, the mighty hand of Pharaoh. The creator of the world, as Moses revealed them to to the Israelites. My God can do this. Couldn't he? It's not beyond him. I think you might say that Jonathan knew Ephesians 3.21 much better than most of us. And actually knew it long before Paul actually utters it into writing. Which says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to his power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. 
Amen. Jonathan believes this way before the church even starts to believe this. My God can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that he asks. Therefore, Jonathan, who is appealing to the God of Israel, who delivered the nation out of Egypt and the creator of the universe, he is now not lacking any confidence that God can actually defeat the Philistines by just two people. You might even say that this is a greater than Gideon right now in the history of Israel. Two people. In my conclusion, I like this title that, um, that Dale Ralph Davis gives to this particular chapter and about, about um, Jonathan. And he says, what Jonathan brings to, to the table is the imagination of faith. The imagination of faith. What a great way of visualizing this particular chapter. God, I believe that not only can I traverse this rocky crag, this hard place, to get to the other side. I believe that, though I'm probably going to be pretty beaten up by the time I get to the other end, I could also win the victory on the other side. Talk about the odds being against you. Talk about an imagination. There's no getting away from the fact that faith takes great sacrifice. And more often than not, it means coming out of our comfort zones. What we actually might see once we do that is that our comfort zones have not actually been places of comfort, but actually have been traps. They've been prisons of themselves. I think we look back and see the, the, the in verse 4 and 5, um, or sorry, 2 and 3, about the, the rejected establishment. I think you would actually start to see that Saul is in a prison of his own. He wants to live in a world where God isn't in control. And so therefore he is now living in that restriction. As many of us have been in previous times, as many of us might still be. I can't do anything. I can't get out of this. We might even find that our prisons are comfortable places, places where we find our pleasure, places where we find freedom from pain, freedom from our our rock and a hard place. That it would be irresponsible to engage in such a difficult venture. Let's go with the flow. Let's not change anything. Let's keep things as they are. Knowing God is able to to do a work through you requires you to have a bigger vision of God. I like this statement also by T.W. Tozer. He said that no nation would ever outgrow its religion. But it's this part I find even more compelling. He said, No person will rise above their perception of God. It's a deep statement. And I wish I could have the time to unpack that for you today, but I want to maybe highlight the surface of what that actually means. It's very easy to make your risk averseness look like maturity. As I said, faith is not irresponsibility. We can, we can sit and say, well, I'm being a mature adult here. I'm not going to get involved in things I can't handle. 
in that sense, Saul could look very mature. Well, 600 men is hardly enough to, to engage with the enemy. Let's wait for a bigger army. We may feel un- uncomfortable to change what we're accustomed to. But I want to lay some challenges out to you. To you, first of all, the believer. Are you no longer willing to dare? Remember the old song, Dare to be a Daniel? Today I want to say, would you dare to be a Jonathan? And have a big vision of God? Or are you like the man who buried his talent because he saw God as a mean and angry God? Matthew 25 says this, he says, He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you had to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. Is, is, is that where we're at today? No longer able to take risks for God. No longer thinking big for God. The church in the UK needs big thinkers, big believers, with big visions for this country. To you who have not yet acknowledged God as your personal or the Son, acknowledged God or received His Son. Or even receive the Holy Spirit into your life. I want to start off with a famous quote from a movie. When, um, for those of you who may have seen the, the movie Jaws. I always think of this when I see big problems. There's a point where they see the shark for the first time. Where Brody sees the shark for the first time as they're out in the deep water. And he turns to Quint, the owner, the, the big shark hunter. And he says... You're going to need a bigger boat. I love that line. They suddenly get a grasp of what they're actually in. And the first thing he says, you're going to need a bigger boat. You who do not know the Lord, as your problems dwarf your resources, can I say to you, you're going to need a bigger God. You're going to need a bigger perception of who God is. Who can actually help you. The infinite God is not beyond you because he has come in the form of man. Sometimes we have this thing of, oh God is too far away. But he came as the man Christ Jesus. This Jesus lived perfectly before humanity and taught us that because He lives without fear. He lives without sin. He says that you can also share in that life too. His life can be your life too. And if you accept it, you can live without the fear and the worry this world and its troubles can bring. In fact, the world's troubles are reminders that we need God. No government is going to change you, no matter what decision you make. Next month, the UK will still need God. I can assure you that. And I can assure you that Trump will not fix America. Only Jesus can. He gives this great promise and he says this to us in Matthew 6, 25 to 26. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Jesus also died the death that we should have died. 
But that's not where it stops. He was also resurrected. So that we may be assured that we will also live in him as well. The resurrection is God's guarantee that this life is not all there is. That we can live in a perfected world with Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Today I'm not pointing you to Jonathan, though he is obviously the subject of our text. I'm pointing you to the God of Jonathan. The God that came in the form of Jesus Christ. The God that has given us the Holy Spirit so that we might believe. How do you see God today? Are you allowing a place for him? Who do you say his son is? If Jesus is not God, he cannot save us. Are you denying the work of God's Holy Spirit as well? Do you feel that irrational tug of war in your life, that desire to be responsible with your life, to not rock the boat, to not go into this dangerous God stuff, this crap stuff that seems to prop people up, yet I seem to be very interested in. The more I hear, it sounds better than what I hear out there. I want to invite you to make a deep decision in your own heart about what that might mean today. Let's pray. Father, I leave this word, Father, for us all to ponder. What can we say to these things? Lord, as Paul said, if God be for us, if you be for us, who can be against us? I pray, Father, for all the problems that might actually be, the rock and the hard place so many of us might actually be in right now, whether it be debts, whether it be relationship issues, whether it be health issues, Lord. So many things, oh Lord, that can plague our lives. I pray, Father, that that rock and a hard place that we are in right now will not minimize our vision of who you are, your goodness and your ability to save to the utmost. And even if it's not in this lifetime, in the lifetime to come. Father, for us who have believed and have believed a long while, Lord, can you strengthen our faith today? Can you give us a bigger vision of who you are? Lord, give us a hope, Father, for a nation that is turning its back on you, that, Lord, that you can revive it again. Will you give us big hearts like that? Lord, help us, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.